he had been involved for some period of time in uh, a couple of albums in um, trying to express this newfound Christian connection that he had made. And um, this album, this body of material seemed to be a way of combining that with a some heading back into a realm that was not as uh, defined by, specifically defined alone by sort of revealed religious imagery, but was also full of that kind of wild personal poetry that I'd always, always associated with his music. I loved the stuff and I could tell that he was slightly unsettled about how, how it was and that he was in a very creative period. Um, as a writer. And I became concerned at some point that if we carried on too long trying to figure out whether this was ready to cook, um, th that he might burn by the material, as I have, have seen other really prolific writers do. I didn't know him well enough to know whether that would happen, but I could tell there was a danger of it. And I said, look, we have a, is, I said, I have a studio in Hollywood that's a perfectly adequate place to do some just relaxed, just like demo recordings. Let's just go in and record some stuff. Let's not worry about whether, you know, we're making a record or we're not making a record. You know, uh, um, let's just go do this. It's not a problem, you know. I, 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 I have the studio and... We could take a few days and just see what happens. Chuck had come into it. He said, come on, let's come over to my studio. That way we can run some tape on the, on the songs, see what they sound like, and see where to go from there. You know, to, is there any alteration in the, sound, the song structure and things like that? So Bob evidently had said, sure. And so we got the people together. And I've never really been put off at how many people are in the room or anything. This was a little bit different. I think we ended up with 14 people in the room that was about 25 by 25. Bob didn't want any baffles in between people and he didn't want to use any headphones. And so I rigged up a system where I used our headphone feed to drive uh, little small speakers, like little oratones almost, that would be placed around near some of the players. But uh, all 14 of them were in the same room. I felt like I knew what, what, what was happening there, what we were doing, that we were doing something really beautiful and really wonderful and wild and amazing. And that he would like it when we were done. But we weren't calling it a record. So there was no discussion about, there were discussions about details. Um, I guess um, sort of um, process details that were critical uh, in terms of what we ended up with. But it wasn't, we, didn't, we, we, we weren't talking about a sound for a record. We were just cutting these things to get something down on tape. Um, I knew that he had had some, uh, some sense of discomfort with a highly formalized and highly controlled approach. He had some, what seemed at the time to me, slightly odd comments to make about the making of Slow Train, which I thought was a very admirable piece of work in many ways. And he was uncomfortable about having the thing too, control, too produced. That is, I think, too much heavy-handedness on the part of people who were used to being in control and responsible and feeling responsible and in control and wanting to make sure, you know, to carefully husband the thing. In the service of that, um, that goal, people tend to be a bit over, over controlling. Bob wasn't a guy who, he just wasn't comfortable in that sort of environment. And we did talk, there was that we had that little discussion in terms of talking about past recording experiences and what he was looking for and so forth. We didn't talk too much about how we were going to do this, but 
we talked a little bit about how we weren't going to do it. In the world of recording, to philosophize for a minute, there's two things. One is you're making a recording or you're recording a performance. And then the other aspect is you're producing a record. And Bob is more someone that you're recording a performance. The objective is to catch the performance. He tended to be always late to the sessions, and uh, his lateness varied from a little bit late to three hours late, generally. And we would have someone standing outside the studio or something, and when Bob pulled up, they'd run inside, let everybody know. Musicians would get at their place if they weren't already there, sitting around waiting. And Bob would walk in, and most of the time he'd walk through the hallway and walk past the control room and walk into the studio, and his assistant was there with a guitar, and Bob would, yeah, okay, great, and he'd pick up the guitar, and somebody would point him to where the microphone was to use, and he'd walk over and sort of start playing, uh, you know, pretty much whatever he felt like doing, and Chuck would talk to him and say, well, are we going to do this song or what song, and like that, and Bob would decide, and Bob would just start playing, and we did get him to play the stuff a few times, but most of the time he would play the song, the band would kind of catch up and drop into place on it, and then um, <clears throat> you'd get the take, then he'd move on, he'd do something else. Uh, our rule was uh, always have the multi-track tape running when Bob was in the room with his guitar on and anywhere near a microphone. Uh, when the multi-track wasn't running, it was a two-track of all the mics up in the, in, in the room so that we always were able to capture everything that went on. Yet this organic approach to the recording also filtered into the mixing stage, when Dylan rejected Plotkin's more finely honed versions of the tracks and insisted that the songs maintain the gritty aspect of the original monitor mixes. Dylan wanted the record as unpolished as possible, and upon its release, the rough edges were very apparent. I was anxious. I was afraid, really. I was frightened. You feel responsible. And... Uh, uh, but it didn't last for very long. That is, I didn't, I just, I would have kept going. I was a, a kind of, I just would have kept going. I was a keep going kind of guy. And uh, that's how come I ended up being a record producer and Dylan is Dylan. He's a, like, catch the thing and get it, get the essential thing right um, from some deep intuitive place and don't overwork it. Don't mess it up. And it was a good, you know, we managed. I, I, it was a great experience for me. And I don't, I, I don't remember, I don't think I carried for more than a half a day uh, any, uh, any unmanageable anxiety about not continuing to do the mixes until the mixes pleased him. Because he was so pleased with the roughs. Because they had that thing. They weren't... They weren't reprocessed. It's like one level of processing, the recording and the rough mixing. That was, that was as much messing with the stuff as was needed.